Welcome into this Five Clubs conversation. I'm Gary Williams. When she was playing, she was absolutely one of my favorites. And her last competitive stroke was to win the Solheim Cup. That was in 2019. I'm talking about Suzanne Pedersen. She won 15 times on the LPGA Tour, seven additional wins on the LET, two-time major champion. In my time covering the game of golf, there have been a handful of players that I felt their entire time in the throes of trying to be great, that they were redlining virtually the whole time. And when she walked away from the game, she talked about that, that once she knew that she was gonna have a child, like everything changed. The way that she thought about the game, the way that she thought about her life. Her life now, obviously is very different, but she's putting herself right back in the middle of it as the captain of the European Solheim Cup team. Not only this coming fall, but it, then again next year. Like, why are they doing this back to back? Does she like that idea? Her career, her life now, and that last putt. If it didn't go in, would she still have walked away? All of that coming up on this Five Clubs Conversation. only a grip it's only my soul connection to this it's only in my hands on every single shot it's an extra two yards of carry when it matters most yeah only a grip mine are only golf pride respect the grip and with that, we welcome in the Solheim Cup captain for Europe, Suzanne Pedersen. It's good to see your face. How you doing? I'm doing great, thanks. Uh, you know, it's it's. Um, I said this in the open. Um, you're one of my favorite people because when I when I was covering the sport on an everyday basis, not that I'm not doing it now, there were certain people that just totally committed, and you were that. Um, and I look at you now, and yeah, there's a golf bag in the backdrop, and you're, you're immersed in the process of constructing a team soon enough, but how about life? How is life? Life after golf is actually fantastic. Uh, it's hard to believe when you're right in the bubble and golf is everything in your life, but I guess having kids is uh, one other aspect. Uh, it kind of <laughs> puts golf on the, on the second, uh, second tier. Um, but, um, you know, I really enjoy myself. I enjoy being back in Norway, raising the family, two kids, one dog, a husband, a uh, full household, uh, literally every day. Uh, there's no there's no protocol of how the, word, the day kind of starts and ends. So every day is a little different, but um, we're hanging in there. Uh, I feel like we're starting to get over the hurdle with the... the smallest girl being almost two years old so we're getting there um i'm gonna read to you some of your words because the letter you wrote to herman before he was born was very revealing about about you know the commitment you made so here are some of your words my identity was linked to my job how i played how my practice sessions went on a particular day um how many putts i made or missed all of that affected my moods my priorities my relationships and most of my decisions, I was, some I was to some degree selfish, which I considered a prerequisite for success. Um, none of that stuff surprises me at all. How far removed are you from thinking that way now? You know, it's, um, yeah. it's, a, it's quite an interesting kind of topic because when you're right in the middle of your career, um, you're living in a bubble. Um, you don't realize it uh, when you're there, but now in retrospect, I can actually look back and kind of see everything from the outside. Um, you come to realize what a bubble uh, you live in. I mean, you're living, a, you're living the dream, you get to do what you love the most. Uh, all decisions you're taking is kind of literally how you can become a better golfer. Um, you're very selfish on kind of who you surround yourself with, where you practice. 
uh, how you kind of treat yourself, what you eat, uh, everything is with the purpose of becoming a better golfer. Uh, now uh, I look back and I can, even I can actually say, I wish I maybe was nicer to myself, uh, kinder in a way. Um, because when you actually do well, uh, treat yourself like, give yourself a tap of, clap on the shoulder. Uh, because obviously in golf you lose more than you win. Um, that's obvious. Um, but I kind of wish I was a little bit more relaxed. But at the same time, I think my DNA was kind of very hard, very structured, uh, very egocentric. Uh, and I think that was a part of uh, who I was as a golfer, but I also think it made me the player I became. So um, when I talk to all these players that are currently playing, and I would, I mean, to some of the European players that know me quite well, and I would go, hey, stop it. It's just another tournament. It's just another shot. Who cares? I mean, it's not life or death. Uh, there's always next week. And they're like, and this comes from you? <laughs> they literally <laughs> don't believe it. But I mean, I, I mean, even though I was very tough and hard on the golf course, I was uh, fairly relaxed once I got my golf shoes off, even back in my heyday. And uh, that's pretty much who I am today, though. Uh, so I'm, I'm a lot more laid back. And people ask, how are you going to kind of uh, captain the, the European team? Are you going to be kind of... The, the one you were as a player? I don't think so. Uh, I have no control, so I, I can't do that. So, um, uh, yeah, uh, it's, it kind of feels nice. Uh, I don't have to have sleepless nights or trying to figure out my golf swing or holes that I'm playing in the next day that I have nightmares about or, you know, every bad routine as a golfer uh, everyone goes through. Uh, you mentioned DNA. When you were growing up, Having brothers, do you think your brothers instilled in you a competitiveness or do you think you were predisposed to be the way that you became? No, uh, um, I definitely feel like it was it was part of my childhood being the third out of three kids and the youngest. And I can definitely see that now on my, my own kids, the, the, the second one. She doesn't take no for an answer. Uh, and every day is, she's trying to kind of reach up to, to Herman's kind of uh, skill level or trying to outdo him in every sense of the way. So I think it kind of comes natural um, if you have it or not. Um, and out of the two kids I have, I think uh, if I had to put my money on who's going to become a golfer, it's the youngest one. Wow. I can already tell. She already has it. She has like, she's more interested in ball swinging she's like she's got it but um the competitiveness i think it really comes kind of with your upbringings and kind of with your surroundings as well i i know that you'll support anything that your kids want to do um if your daughter does pursue golf um you know look there's a there's a great deal of reward that can come from it and i'm not talking about the financial part of it i'm talking about relationships and and, and, you know, the success of achievement and all that stuff. Is there anything about it that you would have misgivings about? No, not really. I just, I mean, you can kind of uh, try and guide your kids into what you would love them to do. But at the same time, they did, it would have to come from their heart. Uh, my oldest, he's a skier. He's already kind of following his dad's footsteps. So I kind of lost that battle. Uh, <laughs> uh, but... Uh, you know what? I think there's so many, so many great things about just doing sports in general. Uh, in your childhood, I think it's good to do a little bit of everything in the beginning, and then maybe if you're really good, or if you're very talented in in one sport, I mean, you should probably spend more time doing that one sport um, eventually. But I think it's a very good balance to do a little bit of everything. Um, I mean. Everything from gymnastics to football to ice hockey, skiing, golf, tennis. I mean, expose them to everything. Uh, let them try and uh, they'll, they'll figure it out. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that philosophy. There was a, one of my favorite books is a book called Range. Um, and it's about how generalists can thrive in a specialized world. And the first chapter is about the different upbringings of Roger Federer and Tiger Woods. And that Tiger was very singularly focused on, on golf, 
uh, and there was not much, not that he didn't do other things, he ran track, but, but that Federer and his parents, his, his parents let Roger decide what he wanted to do. And like his, his own tennis instructors wanted him to move up in age at an early age because he was so good. And they said, well, we'll ask him what he wants. And what he wanted was to play with his friends and to kick the soccer ball around when tennis practice was over. And look, obviously it worked out exceptionally well for both, but I do believe that let, let the kids find the focus when the focus is the right time. And you agree with that. I do, but I mean, I also have to say time has changed. And I think the, the, um, the way information flows through social media now, um, yeah. kind of down to like the early ages, early teenagers stages. Um, I th I mean, you can just, uh, I think the information of skill skills, uh, comes down earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you look at, I mean, the biggest sports in, in the world. I mean, soccer, football, tennis. Um, it's like the world number ones, they're just getting younger and younger. Yeah. I mean, look at tennis. I mean, US Open final a couple of years ago, an 18 year old and a 17 year old. Uh, look at all the Korean girls that we've seen on the LPGA for years. I mean, they are, they're literally professionals from their 13. If you want to be the best in the world, whether you want it or not, you should probably be more specific in, in how you spend your time from an earlier age, even though I, it's not nothing that I would encourage. But if 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 the kids really want to pursue something, I'm, I would be all for facilitating for them to kind of become as good as they want. But it would have to come from them and not from you as a parent. Um, the competing is an interesting thing. And I always thought that you loved the competition. But it's one thing to love it when it's over upon reflection and go, God, that was a lot of fun. Was it fun in the middle of it? I really enjoyed it. Um, but I also must say what I miss the most now um, and probably what I loved the most uh, when I was right in the middle of it, it was kind of the process building up to kind of big weeks, like everyday work, like every hour, every minute you put in to kind of to your practice, to whatever you did. Uh, that's kind of the structure in your everyday life. That's kind of what I miss and that's kind of what makes you good. Uh, you just make sure you cover every aspect. You have a plan on what to practice at what time, how much, or you need to work on your short game and you do these tweaks with your coach and like the small kind of, um, small tweaks every day and the important kind of decisions you take every day uh, to kind of, th that will make the bigger picture. That's kind of what I love the most. Um, but that, that's also where all the frustration was. Uh, everyone who plays golf knows uh, the body feels different every single day. You wake up one morning feeling like a million dollar and the next day you feel like you never touched a golf club before. And even as a professional, uh, we have days like that. Um, and sometimes you have it and you feel like nothing could ever change it. And two weeks later, you don't even know where how to find the fairway. And kind of the process of keeping the structure, keeping that flow, keeping the consistency um, week in, week out, month after month, year after year. I think that's kind of what drove me. Um, and that's also why I was probably so hard on myself because I was always looking ahead and never really looked backwards um for the good or the bad um so uh yeah i love the competition but the competition was always great fun if you knew you were prepared it's like go going out for an exam if you've done your work you're prepared you can't wait for the paperwork to come and come in come in your hands and if you haven't done your homework uh you're just terrified um so um i didn't have too many of those terrified moments standing on the first day not feeling like i wasn't prepared but there were days where you like, you just had to f play with whatever you had that day. And uh, I have to say, I probably played more rounds with like a B game rather than my A game. Uh, but that was fun as well. You know, look, great players, and you were obviously a great player. You know, Jack Nicholas has said it, Tiger has said it. Jack said, look, I, I won 18 majors. I might have been really at my best maybe a third of those times. Maybe, um, which again is, is 
it's such an extraordinary thing about the game that you got to you got to manage what you have because there is no reliance on others. I mean, it's and that's when it just comes down to you. That's why obviously achievement could be you know so personally rewarding. Did you compare yourself to other people? starting at an early age, or did you just try to compare yourself against what you thought were reasonable expectations for yourself? Well, I always looked at the, the better players, and I love kind of digging in in their heads. Uh, I was fortunate enough to kind of uh, get to know Annika quite well, uh, not only on from kind of a competitive uh, side, but also more on the friendly side, and I obviously I got to compete with her alongside her in the Solheim, and that's kind of really when I started to kind of dig into her brain, what she was thinking, kind of where she was at. And I learned so much from that. And that's something I would never have been able to read in a book. Uh, just to be next to her, kind of in her decision making, knowing what she's thinking, like her kind of uh, attitude, uh, all those aspects. And I always he had a lot of fun practicing and getting to know Tiger uh, during his prime. He lived in Orlando, I lived in Orlando, and I was terrified first time I met him because I was like, I have to use this opportunity for what it's worth. I don't know if I will ever meet him again. So, I mean, I was, he, I was prepared. I had tons of questions and I was curious about his work ethic, how he was always so sharp, like teeing up, like only playing 14 events a year and he, every time he showed up he was so sharp and um but at the same time i think the best players also enjoy spending time with people that want to be better and kind of challenge themselves so uh one thing led to another so i mean i spent hours practicing with tiger and i learned a lot from him as well so i was never scared of walking up to like Whoever had the best short came on the LPGA, standing next to her, like asking questions, understanding. Uh, knowledge for me was always uh, the priority. Like if you have the knowledge and you understand it, I mean, build your own library. And at the end of the day, on the golf course, you're on your own. The bigger that library is for you to make the right decision, most likely the better golf you're going to play. So that's kind of that was kind of a little bit of my philosophy and. Um, I still think uh, whatever you do, always reach out a hand to people that you know are better than you. Um, so uh, I think that's always going to help you. Yeah, you know, I, I've shared this periodically. One of my favorite sayings is that we don't, we don't rise to the occasion. We fall to the level of our training. And it's reflected in the results. I mean, it, you can say, well, you know, they were good in the moment. They were prepared for the moment. Um, you know, and that's Tiger. It's interesting. You mentioned him and Annika. Let me get you. Let me get your thought on seeing him still trying to do this. And now he's had a he's an, he's had another procedure. I personally think and it's not about his it's not about it being the benchmark, him making cuts at majors to him. I think it's a mile marker like, OK, I, I can I could I did that now on to the next. And I, I do think it's part of the process. Did you watch the Masters at all? And if you did, did you see yeah. him kind of laboring around just and making another cut? Um, to get to this point where he is right now, I think it's more stubbornness that gets him there. Uh, and I mean, yes, obviously, I, even I would love for him to go out and win another Masters if it's that realistic. I'm not too sure uh, if everyone else plays their A game. I don't know if if he still got it. I like, I, but I mean, really, I hope I'm wrong. Uh, I mean, we were all wrong. Like when he won. Me too. Uh, Me too. Uh, FedEx, uh, not too many years ago. But at the same time, I don't know. Uh, but it, I was always surprised. I mean, I remember back in I think it was like 2000 seven 2008 almost right before his uh kind of life collapsed a little bit and he, he kept talking about like how bad his short game was and i'm like what do you mean your short game even if you have your like your c game you're way better than anyone else any given day and he's like but that's not good enough for me i want to get better and that's kind of that's what champions are made of um it, it's it, only they can tell uh if they're satisfied if they're uh, happy with where they're at um, and I was a little bit like that as well I mean when he did get injured I mean 
it's 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 amazing how quickly your brain kind of reverts and all of a sudden your next kind of small baby step goal is like how to be injury free as soon as you can how you can do that process as good and how and relentless uh kind of work to kind of get back to where you want to be and um i just really hope he's happy doing what he's doing uh, because it seems like a lot of work uh, and a lot of effort for not really achieving what he really wants to achieve i'm not sure i hope i'm wrong but that's kind of what it looks like you know suzanne i i wrote about this last week that uh, look they're geniuses in in the arts in music in sports He's a genius, um, and, and genius is not always tidy. Uh, it's not intended to be pretty, and I think when you're a genius, there can be torment that is associated with measuring yourself against yourself. And, and do, did you think during those times when he was, like you mentioned, 2007, 2008, did he enjoy the, the, the accomplishment because he was achieving more than anybody else? Was he satisfied, or was there little satisfaction that came with all that he was doing i don't know it's i mean i can only uh, i remember i was at his house and i remember reading rory's uh quotes uh i think it was probably around the masters when rory went to his house and like he walked into the to the entry and here was like his like trophy shelf was the few majors and none of the other trophies were ever to be seen and i remember the same and like i walked in i mean like the the one major was standing next to the tv one was here and then and i asked where's the rest he's like i don't care like the only thing that he cared about was the majors and uh, so um i think uh i think he's what i think he is i think he just wants to stay somehow competitive to get ready for the seniors um if his body would heal up and kind of be ready to go in in in, in those few years uh, that's left of uh, his waiting game but I, th I think maybe that's where his uh, mind is at uh he just wants to be around the game play competitive kind of test his game uh, and then hopefully enjoy some some good years on the seniors play with his buddies enjoy it and yeah i don't know you, you, you annika um annika <laughs> She does it a handful of times a year. That's how many events there are. She's playing in these celebrity events, and she's playing against elite athletes who, who excelled at other sports. They're good players. I've played with some of them. They're very good. Most of them are younger than her. Are you surprised she's doing this? I actually play with her in Portugal in uh, end of January. And, I mean, it depends on the occasion, but the event we played was like a pro-am celebrity thing. Yes. And it's amazing, like when you're right there in the in the surroundings, you kind of all of a sudden you get right into the bubble. You go to the range to warm up. I'm like, why am I going to the range to warm up? I don't know. I'm, I might waste all the good shots. I don't know what to work on. I was like, they were all standing there. It was like little Lorraine. It was Annika. It was like tons of great players. And Annika was, yeah, she was just the way she's always been. You know, she had changed potter grip because she she kind of felt like she had the yips. And I'm like, yeah, nothing changes. But he kind of constantly grinds and grinds. And But I think uh, it's, you know what? That's what we've done our entire life. I don't think we know anything else. Uh, and I, I can put myself right in that bowl as well. After three days of spending time with like pro golfers, ex-golfers, great players. I mean, all we were thinking about is like, how do you can score two or three or four <laughs> shots better every day. It's like... We're all brain damaged for life. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I mean, I like, you know, when you were saying how Tiger, you know, he's going to play this senior tour. And I agree with you. I think he will. Like every great player talks about, oh, I'm never going to be a ceremonial golfer. I'm never going to do that. The hell you aren't. It's That's what you do. They all do it. Jack did it. Arnold was always going to play golf until, you know, you, you were around him. I mean, he, nobody loved golf more than he did. And Annika, she just, I mean, and she's, here's the other thing, Suzanne, that she's, she's like really animated now, where she used to be so subdued and serene. Now she's like pumping up the crowd. It's like, who is this person? Yeah. But I also think, I, mean, um, I also think that Will, her son, is yes. so into the game. Yep. Has kind of uh, fired her up even more. Uh, and she really enjoys kind of sharing kind of, 
her world uh, with the, one of her kids that are really falling in love with the game. So I think that also helps from her side, or I think that's kind of a huge kind of um, leading star for her um, to be able to go out and kind of practice hit balls and share experiences with uh, with him. I am. Um, so, I mean, uh, life changes, you know. Uh, golf is, might not be the most important thing, but there's so many great values in golf that you would love to kind of uh, pass on to your kids or to your, to your loved ones. So, uh, yeah. You, um, one of the last times I was around you was at Brad and Billy's great charity event that they would have every year in Rhode Island. Um, and you were, you were dating your now husband at the time. But I always felt, and I went there every year, like total, you were so comfortable around the guys. Um, and, and, you know, look, that's not, that's not, a, that's not a given. Um, you're not spending a lot of time around, you know, a lot of male professional golfers. You mentioned, you know, being in Orlando when Orlando was kind of a hotbed for tour players, you were, where, where does that come from? Is that because you had brothers or you just, you know, you like being around the guys? Uh, I've always been a tomboy um always um uh, and i still enjoy being around uh, my husband's bodies you know they're uh less drama easy a lot less drama fuck it out uh you <laughs> fight it out you play it out whatever uh, uh, it's probably part of my childhood uh having dealt with two older brothers and all their friends and um like I said, oh, and I always like, especially in golf, uh, where obviously they're going to hit the ball further than us. They play longer courses. They might play a tougher kind of pin placements. I love those aspects. I mean, when I was in Orlando practicing, I, I played from the very back because I thought if I can manage to get around the course from what, 7,200, 7,300, 7,400. It's going to feel like a piece of cake when you come and play 6600 in the US Open somewhere down along the along the way. So I always looked at it as a benefit. I mean, if the guys were hitting a wedge, I might have hit four iron. Who cares? I mean, and then you hit it close and that was a big gem. So uh, small, small celebrations. Um, let's talk about the Solheim Cup because it's it's a big part of of, you know, your body of work your presence on that team from a rookie to the touchstone of, of, I think, the entire organization of European Solheim Cup to obviously the last moment. But I want to go back to 2002 um, in the Michelle Redmond singles match, um, which drew a smile from you, which I appreciate. Um, when you're five down, you're done. I mean, come on, you're, you're, you're more than done. Why were you not done? I don't know. Um, I think it's just my competitiveness, never to give up. But, and, I, and I remember Annika was either in front of me or behind me. Um, and she was kind of, I, I think I was kind of, I guess I was looking at the leaderboard and I could see she was kind of back and forth. She was fighting and she was, she, it, it was looking like she was turning her match around. And I don't know if that gave me the sparks uh, that, okay, I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to give in. There's always opportunities. And that's kind of the one thing I learned from her. Uh, you fight until there's no more holes to be played. Um, and uh, that was kind of my start or kick kickstart into the, to the life of the Solheim and everything that that had to kind of uh, uh, give us. Um, and uh, it was like playing at the highest level, uh, the biggest stage, uh, and learning to love how to handle it. Uh, it's like that was kind of my first kind of learning experience, and uh, from then on, I just really fell in love with the with the um, with the format, the team aspect, and kind of. Uh, and I also I remember like the level of golf that's played at the Solheim and the Ryder Cup. It's unbelievable. Everyone just rises to the occasion and. Putts are made from like, I mean, if you made as many putts as you do in a solo, you'll probably, I don't know what your stroke average would be a year, but it's just amazing how uh, it just the entire atmosphere just brings the best out of pretty much everyone. When you, when you're doing something in such a singular way as you did, and then you have that experience for the first time, 
did you surprise yourself that you loved it so much to, to give of yourself to other people, to share, to be accountable, to be vulnerable? Did that surprise you? No, no, I don't think so. Because I love, uh, you're, never gonna, you're not going to get to the world number one on your own. Uh, and here you, you kind of teamed up with good friends. You got to know good players. And uh, sitting here today, I mean, I have uh, great friends for life through kind of what we've experienced and uh, rides we've shared uh, and journey uh, journeys that's been kind of created along the way on the golf course. Uh with a win or a loss, I mean, it doesn't really matter the outcome. It's more the process. You're in it together. Uh, and that's kind of, I think, what unites, uh, especially the European players, um, so well. And um, I've been fortunate enough to to be able to talk to a lot of past captains, both Solheims and Ryder Cups. And um, uh, we, we're all in it for the same reason. Uh, we just love competing and we love going out there to fight for one another. The, um, the, the last Solheim Cup for you as a player in 2019, I, I, I want to know whether you think that would have happened if 2018 didn't turn out the way that it did, because you wrote at that time, you wrote, once it became obvious that I was going to take the full year off, it was like a weight had been lifted off my chest. It was that moment I realized what an insular, insular bubble, as you've talked about, I'd been living in for 20 years. Did that perspective give you the drive to try to do it one more time the following year? No, but it was more like I was always curious. This is this is where it comes down again, like uh, champions or tough competitors. You always question yourself. Can you get back to, to the highest level? Can you put in the work? Can you put in the hours? Uh, are you still managed to pull off? Uh, a high cut, you know, uh, when it really matters. Can you pull off that massive draw where you need to get another six, uh, six yards out of it uh, on the par five on 18 to eagle to win at the last? I mean, and all these questions, all these questions, I, I mean, obviously I was thinking about it. Uh, I was like, do I still have it? I mean, even though after having a child, I'm like, everything can be out of me. Uh, and I was curious. And uh, I remember when I started practicing and I was really gearing up uh, to play that Dow Great Lakes Bay Invitational, which was was my first event back in 2019 after what, uh, 10, well, 15 years, uh, 15 months break. And I remember standing on the range at Bay Hill and I mean, obviously it had been a lot of frustration, you know, when you start to like, it's so much hard work to kind of get the timing, to get the finesse, to get the feeling. All of a sudden, you start and you start flushing it. And I remember like flushed it once, flushed it twice. And I kind of looked around, no one there to see it or watch it. I'm like, am I just dreaming or can I still do this? And that's kind of when I started to kind of get the sparks again. And I'm like, shoot, this is fun. Like one great shot makes up for the last thousands that felt like shit. And that's kind of uh, so I think when I said it was more relief more than kind of obviously it was fun and exciting and all that but when I made that final putt or like the the final stretch uh, kind of that back nine on the Sunday when it was like literally Europe had to win whatever last three or four matches to win or it felt it was nerve wracking. And I remember talking to myself, walking up the 18th uh, fairway, I'm like, I'm getting too old for this because I'm getting gray hairs just kind of thinking about this. And um, so to, to kind of deliver and kind of execute what you've been dying to do one more time at the highest level, uh, that, that work was so hard that when I finally did, it was more like you lifted everything off my shoulder and I'm like, you know what, uh, been there, done that, I proved to myself that I managed to get myself back here. Um, and that was kind of enough for me. Uh, but at the same time, knowing your, your game is still good enough to compete at the highest level, I, people are like, so why did you give up? They're like, you could have like a second run. I'm like, but it doesn't matter if I had another win, another medal, or it, it, it doesn't make life or life any better or worse. Uh, when it comes to that, then you've lost it. Uh, then the edge is gone. Um, if uh, if you don't really, if it's not life or death, if you kind of finish first or third, uh, then I think uh, 
over a longer period of time, you're probably not going to be able to to sustain that level. The the putt you made in 2019 against Marina Alex um, will go down as one of the great putts, um, whether it's team golf or just golf. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with the context of the putt because you said immediately afterwards, nothing will ever beat this. So I think we can just say enough is enough. I think it's interesting that you use the word we and not, not I can say enough is enough, we. Your, your husband was in your life, you had a child. We matters to me. There's a profound part of you using that word. And, and he ran onto that green as did a sea of other people. If the putt doesn't go in, in is it still over? You know what, Gary? I really don't have to answer that question. Because that's never <laughs> Thank God I don't have to answer that question because from what I know, it's still going in. Uh, it will always I, go in. I don't know. This was not a decision made like days in advance. I mean, nobody knew this. This was like an instant uh, mic drop that it was. It just felt right uh, there and then. Uh, and I have had no regrets in the aftermath of it. So I think it was the right call. Yeah. Uh, look, I can tell for people who can't see her, um, you, you look, you look great, and obviously it looks like, um, by all accounts, it does it, it it does agree with everything that you've done in the aftermath of it. The taking on the responsibility is of no surprise to anybody that you're going to captain the team. Doing it two years in a row, God, this is a hell of a task to do this. There's a lot of detail. There's a lot of tedium, I'm sure, associated with this. Zoom calls out the ass, I'm sure, uh, here, there, and everywhere. Why do it twice? Well, it kind of makes sense in this term because uh, we're obviously playing in September in yep. Spain and then it's August again back in uh, in the US. So for either team, uh, Stacy or myself to kind of, or for, so, for a new one to pop in and do everything in 11 months, it doesn't make sense. Uh, so that was kind of the, the gig from, from the beginning of when they asked me to do it. They said, Suzanne, uh, would you love, we would love for you to captain but most likely it looked like it would be two two goes in, 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 in a go, two goes in a row. And I said, I'm fine with that uh, because um, I think it's too hard for someone to come in and build a brand new team. And uh, But I must say, uh, it's, uh, it's a different part of being a captain. Uh, I must say it's a lot easier just being a player, show up, uh, play your heart out and leave. <laughs> uh, but I'm enjoying this. It's obviously a new part, and I'm learning a lot. And um, but uh, and it was uh, last um, the last solo I'm in uh, twenty uh, twenty one. Yes. Uh, I mean, uh, it was a little different atmosphere. Obviously, it was very few Europeans there. But to stand on that first tee, not to be nervous, not to have any adrenaline, like like that felt different and felt kind of nice. Uh, I've been studying enough on that first day, having my heart almost up my throat, uh, not knowing how to kind of find the fairway. And um, like I've said in the previous interviews, like, yeah, I mean, uh, being a captain is great, but once the players go out on the course, I have no control. I mean, they're, they are in charge. They know what to do. They play the best golf. Uh, so hopefully I can just facilitate the team, uh, the surroundings of the team, and make every player kind of, uh, yeah, kind of rise to the occasion within themselves. Uh, and that's all I can do. I mean, win or lose, you win, you're here, you lose, you're, you could have done everything different. And you have to be prepared for that. But at the same time, um, to just sit on that golf cart, having uh, no... I can't control anything of the outcome. So um, I just have to kind of rest to peace with that. And uh, from then on, I'm very happy with it. That, that's, that's an absolute irrefutable truth that you can't control anything. But it doesn't mean that I can't ask you what good leadership looks like. What, what, is, what did it look like in the past to you or sound like to you? Well, I feel... Uh, I mean, I'm always trying to create some of my own DNA to kind of my captaincy, but at the same time, you can only be yourself. And I think Beanie wasn't a great example of 
she was easy uh, to be around as a player, as a vice captain, as a team helper. I think Kathleen Matthew did a fantastic job as a captain, and she was just herself. I mean, she was not in like winded up. She wasn't low. She wasn't high. I mean, she was very even uh, emotionally, which made her very approachable. Um, and I take a lot from that. Uh, and I think if I can obviously bring some of the adrenaline, the fire that kind of I had as a player, uh, I'm sure I want to bring some parts of that. But at the same time, I want the players to be involved with decisions that I make or that we make as a captain's uh, captaincy team. Uh, I want them to be part of it. I want them to be part of the communication. Um, there's been previous Solheims where I feel communication has been very uh bad uh you know you get to know the pairing or you, at the opening ceremony uh kind of as a surprise uh, i want the players to take ownership uh and i think that's what kind of um uh they will play better uh feeling like they're more part of it so that's kind of my philosophy and then we'll see how it turns out but um that's how i'm trying to map this out you know, I, certain players, and, and I know that you want to have a lot that, that exhibit this, comfort in confrontation. You know, team golf and playing match play, it's different. I mean, it's, it, it can get uncomfortable. Um, and if you look historically, you thrived in it. Um, Christy Kerr, Dottie Pepper, Julie Inkster, Annika, Lanny Watkins, Paul Azinger, Seve. Not everybody's wired to deal with what is like full contact golf. How no, will you, I mean, how will you know if you've got enough of those? I know, I know my players. <laughs> okay. All right. I, have a good, uh, I have some really good horses, I would say. Uh, but I, that's also one thing that I kind of been observing kind of uh, in 2017 when my back went and I couldn't play and I kind of swapped positions with, uh, with Beanie when she kind of took my playing spot and I kind of became kind of part of Annika's team. I was more an observer and um, I got to kind of see some of the plays from kind of a little different angle. Uh, and I got to tell you, you see straight away if the players have it in their eyes, in their spark and just by the look, you know if they got it. Like you don't have to, a word doesn't have to be said, they get it. Uh, and that's, I mean, I got to say, it's so fun to see like these youngsters who come up now, the, the rookies, I mean, who, I mean, I'd rather have seven rookies on my team who kind of, they don't care who they play. I mean, they have no, like, they go out there and they they play their heart out and they, they do everything to win, uh, obviously in good matters. But uh, I'd rather have that than uh, experience that might be half, half full tank. I don't know. I mean, these young players are so good. Uh, and I really admire and watching them and getting to know them. It's it's been a it's been a fun process up until now, and uh, we have some really good talent coming up on the European side. So maybe not all of them will show here in Spain in September this year, but it will definitely be interesting to see how they kind of kind of pursue their career over the next one, two, three, four years, um, because there are some really good golfers starting to starting to shine yeah I, I i think the rookie thing the idea that you know they that, look these these kids men and women they're so damn good so young now uh, and it's been proven you know you're on the european side i remember when charlie hull was playing paula creamer and and she was you know again she was unfazed yeah she did she find the moment to be huge yeah but but handled it carolina headwall i mean i and go on i mean these sergio in 1999 at 19 some people are just they're they're comfortable in these enormous moments i will say this one last thing on the solheim cup the fact that you're going to do it in the States, I'm, I'm glad you are because, you know, you devoted your life to playing the game and living in this country for a long time. And there are a lot of people uh, who think the role of you and the fact that you're going to have this additional big week and a huge role. Uh, I know you're excited about that. Are you not? I am. I'm very thrilled. I'm happy to. Uh, it's not given when you're kind of given the captaincy that you're going to do it on the um, um, only, I mean, you can't really pick uh, soil. You just you, you take what you're given. Um, 
but I'm happy to do it. And I'm very happy that I'm doing it up against Stacy. I mean, Stacy and I have had very similar career paths. We're almost the same age. Uh, we're both moms. Uh, we kind of, um, we've had a lot of uh, great uh, fights uh, up against each other. Um, so, I mean, that's also fun. We're doing it with kind of uh, someone who's kind of been there along the way with you. Um, so, uh, but I, I mean, I can't wait. And, uh, I can't wait for the week to start in Spain. Uh, there's a lot of golf still to be played for the team to be decided before then. But um, it'll be fun. I can't wait. Let me get you out of here with these five quick questions. The, the golf course you enjoyed playing more than any other in your career that you miss now? I thought... Um, uh, oh, uh, blank. Um, in Pittsburgh, you have. Well, there was Oakmont. Oakmont. Oakmont was one of the. <laughs> the 2010, 2010 U.S. Women's Open that Paula I won. Second, I was like, Paula Creamer hasn't played for like four months. She was out with a thumb injury and <laughs> she beat me by one or two strokes. But I, I got to say, it was one of the courses I really enjoyed playing. I think it was tough, fair, but it was a fantastic, uh, fun golf course to play. St. Andrews is obviously very special, but Oakmont was um, by far one of my favorites. Yeah, not surprised you'd pick a place like that. It's like harder than Chinese arithmetic, like <laughs> while also getting like hit in the head. Um, yeah. It's a great, great place. All right, the activity you share with Christian, your husband, that he's actually better at than you. Skiing. Okay. Uh, the American guilty pleasure you miss most? I don't know. The open stores on Sundays. <laughs> it's pretty easy, though. <laughs> okay. Okay, I thought it would be a food item, but but you are more practical than that. All right, what, yeah. is, your, what is your favorite sound? When the kids sleep, nothing. I, I, I absolutely. Yeah, when I can drop a needle. That, that is, as, as the parent of little children as you are right now, um, that is the best sound. Yeah. Nighttime silence. All right, <laughs> last one. The job or occupation you think you would have been good at? I think I always said it because I love the body and I love kind of using the body, but I've always said it since I was, uh, since, since many years ago, if I hadn't become a golfer, I think I would have been like some kind of physiotherapist or osteopath, uh, working a bit with athletes or working with people who really wants to get somewhere in life. Um, uh, I think that's, uh, I really have an interest in that. You would have been good at that. All right, I'm going to leave you with your own words. You just tell me if this is still true. It's just very nice to not wake up having an agenda. It's nice to not wake up any mornings feeling guilty that you haven't practiced, that you haven't done enough. Question if you're prepared. Are you ready? I don't have to do any of that anymore, and those emotions are gone. That's true. The only thing, I still like to wake up knowing that I have an agenda. <laughs> But everything else is uh, spot on. Uh, again, for those folks who, who can't see her, you look great. Um, I'm so glad I was able to catch up with you. Uh, excited for the opportunities ahead of you. You and your team in Spain and then coming over to the States uh, short of a year's time after that. Thanks so much for doing this. And thanks for having me. I always enjoyed this talking to you and spending time with you, Gary. So uh, all the best. Uh, hopefully we'll uh, see each other soon enough. Thank you. Thank you. See ya. Really appreciate Suzanne taking the time. You know, I think this about great athletes. There's only so much fuel in the tank. And if you idle a lot, maybe you can sustain it longer. The fact that she burned as bright and as hot as she did for as long as she did tells you that she was different. And she will be a great captain no matter what the results are for Europe over the next two Solheim Cups. Really appreciate her. Most importantly, appreciate all of you out there watching and listening to this Five Clubs conversation. We got a ton coming up.
because Webb Simpson's going to be in the studio soon enough with Johnson Wagner and Brendan Young. I know Sam Bennett, the U.S. Amateur Champion, the guy who finished in the top 20 at the uh, Masters, is going to be with Emma Carpenter coming up. And then we're going to have a ton of guys that are going to be joining us during the week of Wells Fargo that you're going to see those interviews uh, coming up over the next month or so. So a lot going on here at Five Clubs. Again, thanks to you for listening and watching. We'll see you next time.